it's about to get a bit dramatic. <sighs> Hi lovelies, if you've never been here before, welcome. My name is Bryony. I do cruelty-free and vegan makeup tutorials and reviews. I'm also a beauty editor at Vegan Magazine as well. And what I wanted to do today was kind of a bit of a deep dive into parent companies. Who owns what? What's really controlled by who? And I know it can be really confusing with what happens everywhere because I know that it's very challenging to know like who's actually cruelty free, who's not. The deal with all of that, I'll give you a bit of a spiel about that in a second, but then also who falls under what brand. So there are roughly seven, that's it, seven conglomerate companies and uh, that's kind of scary when you consider how much of the makeup world they own. So independent companies are actually on decline because they keep getting bought out by these big companies. So it's like, you know how with Disney, you have them eating up places like Fox, they've taken on Marvel, they've got all sorts of like, because obviously we've got Disney Plus, I'm a Disney addict. So it's kind of the same thing as you see like this company that was known for this one thing is actually just kind of expanded and it's just grown massively and that's actually what's happened with these seven companies and so what you see is like you see wheelie and dealing between them you see also like honestly with the research i've done for this video it's like it gets spicy it's crazy and with the theft the ip theft that happens with the secrets and the lies and just like oh my god and there is so much murkiness okay so this is this is massive. I actually want to make this into a series. I think that would be really, really interesting to be able to dive into each one of these companies individually because it's not just, so you've got around about, let's say 50 companies that belong to this one company, but then this company can belong to another company and maybe another one above that. Um, and it's just kind of, you know how they say like there's a hundred companies basically that rule everything. Um, yeah, that, they even have us in makeup too. I've sent myself an email which has got a ridiculous, and I mean ridiculous amount of research I've gone into for this. This is huge. So I'm going to probably speed up some of it as well and I'll just be putting things on screen so then you can uh, screenshot it or pause it so you can actually focus on it yourself. This has kind of been a passion of mine for ages. Like I wrote an article in Vegan Magazine last year all about parent companies and talk about here is kind of the politics behind it and how all of these companies sort of function. I was doing some research on this and there's an insider article which is from like two, two and a bit years ago and it's got these seven companies own this stuff but that's out of date, like well out of date now. Like you can see because I'll be scrolling through it here, it's, it needs serious updating and the thing is when I've been doing this research it has been so hard to actually find who owns what, who belongs to who, because on the company websites, some like they'll say where their brands are, they'll say who they are, and they don't say who they've got licenses with, they don't say who they acquire. Only in very rare cases do they actually do that, and so that can be really challenging. So I've had to be forensic digging here to find out the real tea, the real info, and it shouldn't be this hard to find out who is owned by who? And why are they being this shady? Like, it just feels like there is something that we're not being told as consumers, and that doesn't fill me with a whole bunch of trust, personally. So I just kind of want to preface this with a couple of things. I, I'll, I'll be referring down to my notes sometimes. So I just mentioned that there are the big companies that own like about 50 companies and then they can be owned by other ones. So for example, one would be Kendo. Now Kendo owns uh, Kat Von D and they also own Fenty Beauty. They own Marc Jacobs, Byte and Ole Henriksen as well. But then they're actually also owned by LVMH or Louis Vuitton too. So you've got all of those ones that sit down here, then you've got Kendo, then you've got LVMH. So that's kind of the system that we're kind of working in here. Now I won't be talking about any of those companies for now because there's no point in really doing that because they're not one of the big seven. They're not one of our sharks that we need to have a little inspection of. But I can do a side video if you want me to have a look into that. And also none of the information I'm sharing with you today is stuff that you can't find out yourself. Like I said, it's just been a little bit tricky to actually find it, which is why I thought this sort of thing was necessary. This is all public knowledge. It's meant to be public knowledge. They're not meant to hide anything. It could just be the way that things are worded, where things can be a little bit more legally ambiguous, should we say. So transparency is an issue even for like smaller companies. So you know like, <coughs> 
Wet and Wild looking at you. So obviously they were selling mainland China without actually letting anyone know, therefore we thought that they were cruelty free but they're actually not because rules in China stipulate that animal testing has to happen before particular formulas and they can do animal testing whenever they want for safety reasons. So just, just something to note. And also I've linked all of my sources down below. It's going to be a long description box guys. It's going to be long. <laughs> okay. And it's probably going to take me about two hours to fill out because I'll have like little snippets of like what each bit covers because otherwise you'll just get lost and I want to be as helpful as possible. This is a resource after all. If there is anything that I've missed, please do let me know down in the comments because this is not about ego. This is about sharing information and knowledge and being informed consumers. And I think that is super, super important. So if you do find anything, please let me know down below or call me out, make a video response. I do not mind whatever you do. I think it's really important that people are actually informed and know what's really going on. So the reason that people can have some confusion about parent companies is they don't quite understand the pros and cons of it. So there are a few sides to every story. And so from a business perspective, it can make a lot of sense, especially if you've been struggling. So you know how things like the GFC hit us. There are so many makeup companies out there now. It's highly competitive. If you've got someone that is making products that are super, super similar to yours and they're able to offer them at a lower price point, that's how it can actually be really beneficial to be under a parent company who will kind of take on those lawsuits, take on anything like that, because this is a multi-billion dollar industry. This is massive. This is not like we're talking about some small fry, something that people are making in like their kitchen or whatever. This is big business and uh, whilst it's pretty, they don't really act it sometimes. Anyone that knows like the way that business structures work, um, just kind of skip ahead to this time point here because I'm just gonna give you a little overview of the pros and cons of actually being absorbed by a parent company and what's good and what's not. So when a company has majority stake in the hands of someone else, things can be forced to change against your will. Like, so for example, there's Bare Essentials. So in 2017, they had not been performing as well as what Sushado had hoped. And so they didn't expand into e-commerce, which is something that they should have really been able to predict because it's been very obvious. It's been such an obvious trend that people don't want to go to a store. It takes a lot of effort for me to leave the house. Unless I'm earning money or it's like I absolutely have to, I won't leave the house. So I can understand why other people wouldn't want to as well. Roughly half of their physical stores weren't actually earning money and they were earning well, less. <laughs> so they were running in the red, which is really bad. And so Sushado, obviously being the parent company, they came in and they did their own restructure. Now, as someone that's been through a few restructures, I know what it's like. It's not much fun. It's a very harrowing experience. So they went and closed a hundred stores and they only had what, I think it was around about 250. And so when you think about the percentage of stores that they closed, that is huge. So all of those people got laid off like immediately. And that's just, crazy in itself. So they also adapted the sales strategy and kind of in a way they were sort of like just doing their puppet string thing from above because that's just what you can do as a parent company. So they actually reduced the demographic age that they were targeting. So previously they were targeting like professionals and so they brought that down to be the teens to the 30 somethings. So as a 30 year old myself, I, like I can understand. I mean, I tend to prefer brands that younger people like anyway. So they came in, they swooped, they made change. So Bare Essentials is Bare Minerals, as you'll probably know, um, but Bare Essentials is just like their legal name that they go by. So by doing all of this, they've obviously revitalized the company, which is a great thing, but then you also need to consider like, maybe this isn't what the company owners actually wanted to happen. Because I know when it comes to like, especially more mineral, more natural makeup, like they want to target those older people, but it is younger people. Like when you look at what people are interested in, you just need to look on Instagram and YouTube to know it is actually the younger people that are really interested in making sure that they're avoiding mica and making sure that they're avoiding all sorts of stuff. And they want to have a more natural approach. I mean, like, just look at our Visco girls. I mean, come on. There's a few pros and cons to that, but then also because Sushado did that, they kind of saved the company's ass because otherwise that company, like Bear Essentials would have gone under basically because they were running in the red so much, they would have had to literally file for bankruptcy at the rate that they were going at. It might not have been right then, but it would have been 
something that they could see in the not too distant future. It, it kind of guarantees your business to be able to continue on. Maybe it's not in the way that you wanted it to, but it means that you can carry on with your brand and keep on trying to strive for something. Because Sashado stepped in, that means that they took on that loss. So that year they actually had a 623 million write down subsidiary just for this. And so this is just one example of many. There are so many examples, but it's just a good one to be able to kind of explain like the pros and cons. So not only do you have the risk that's being taken by Sashado, granted, because they've got so many billions of dollars, they kind of have the cushion to be able to handle all of this stuff. They have the legal teams, they know all of the other things that they can do. So granted that one year they made a loss in terms of like, there are lots of graphs. I'll probably have one on the screen right now, but that was the one year that they took a loss. All the other years they're doing great. So they can actually take that hit much better than an individual independent company can. And again, on the flip side, it takes away that independence that people often start companies for. So we've got these wonderful entrepreneurs that are trying to make a difference and try and do something. And so it kind of takes that away. So it's swings and roundabouts, it's pros and cons. This is the part where I'll probably get the most hate for the video. So with parent companies, it's a very dividing thing in the cruelty-free world because there are people who have very different stances on it. So for me personally, I do not purchase products for cosmetics that are made by companies that are owned by parent companies that test on animals because I don't want to feed the bigger beast because I know that the profits that this company makes actually does still trickle up to this big one and so for me because cosmetics aren't really an essential part of life they're not a necessity I choose to opt for the more independent ones the ones that are actually owned themselves or if they do have a parent company they're not ones that test on animals so that's kind of my way of doing it now logical harmony is my favorite resource and I'll be sharing her website down below as well so logical harmony is a great resource if you want to find out who is cruelty free who is not cruelty free who is owned by a parent company that tests on animals and her own stance is that she wants to purchase cruelty free and vegan products from the companies that are owned by parent companies that test on animals because that way it's showing them that there is a definite shift in what people want because the best way to get through to companies is to vote with your dollar and so by voting with your dollar and supporting this company say for example Too Faced because they don't test on animals but their parent company does but due to your funding Too Faced you want that money to go to Too Faced which then signals to the parent company that it's really important that they are cruelty free and that's why that brand is going to explode and then hopefully the more ones that the parent company kind of like Pac-Man gobbles up they're going to be cruelty free as well and not just greenwashed cruelty free <coughs> wet and wild it's all a personal choice i'm not telling you what to do this is just my personal stance and that's why i just wanted to be very open about it now i'm not going to throw judgment or hate at anyone because it's it's makeup at the end of the day it's it's expensive face paint really for me personally i do not purchase from any of the brands that i'm going to be talking about now it's no holds bad <laughs> i kind of want to start with one of the big boys. This is L'Oreal. That The figures for them aren't out yet for 2019, but in 2018, they made 2.69 billion, billion euros. So that breaks down to roughly, let me try and uh, get this number right, 3 billion, 18 million, 946,650 US dollars. That's for one year alone. They've got 39 companies which has gained them this coveted wealth and privilege, which is obviously massive. It's very impressive. Now, I've actually got a full timeline of L'Oreal's acquisitions. And what I want to put on screen right now is I'm going to show you all of the brands that L'Oreal owns so that you can properly have a look through because we'll know a whole bunch of them. Like I mentioned Maybelline, Kiehl's, Biomedic, Colorama, they own Urban Decay, you know Clarisonic, yep yeah, they own that, It Cosmetics. So I actually just want to kind of go down this long, long list. Now this was the longest list in terms of acquisitions I actually came across. I'm out of tea I need for this. So I had to find this information out from multiple sources because on the L'Oreal website they don't display it and then also there's not really one singular place that you can find out 
their entire list because obviously that's done by the companies. Obviously, you have to buy things to be able to access that. So I'm like, I don't need to spend money on this stuff because I ain't even earning money from YouTube yet. So but I'm gonna probably speed this part up. So if my voice is even higher than normal, I apologize, but I just want to make sure that I can share with you all of this because all of that is owned by L'Oreal. They were founded in 1919 and all of their acquisitions are as follows. 1928, they bought Monsevon. 1962, Kadorisin. 1963, they were listed on the stock exchange. 1964, they purchased Long Kong. 1964, they also launched Kiritis. Kiritis. 1965, they bought Jacques Fath Perfume Laboratoire de Langres. 1965, Garnier. 1968, Angers. Cougier, which is a fashion and perfume house. 1970, Biotherm. 1973, Synth Label, which entered them into the pharmaceutical business. 1973, Jamais Rossils and Jean Pierre Bier, which are all beauty companies. 1975, Roja, and that brand later merged with Garnier, which you'll know. 1984, Nestle took over the Warner Cosmetics in the United States on behalf of L'Oreal, US agent, Cosmed, thereby acquiring for the prestigious names of Ralph Lauren, Paloma Picasso, and Gloria Vanderbilt. 1985, they got the Ralph Lauren license. 1989, Helena Rubinstein. 1989, they got a licensing contract with Giorgio Armani. And also in 1989, La roche Posay consolidated its dermatolo dermatological expertise and presence in Pharmacy Network. Then it starts to get really scary. 1993, Redken. 1994, bought control of Cosmere from Nestle. 1995, they bought Maybelline for $758 million, making them the second largest cosmetic producer after Procter & Gamble. 1996, Levin. 1997, Episkin, which is tissue engineering. 1998, Softsheen and Mizani, which is a subsidiary of theirs. 2000, Kiehl's. 2000, Carson. 2000, Matrix Essentials. 2001, Biomedic. 2001, they sold Lanvin to Sean Lam Wang, a Taiwanese media magnate. Whatever that means. 2001, Colorama. 2002, Ineov launches in partnership with Nestle, who hold shares in L'Oreal also. That was a partnership that they formed. 2002, le license agreement with Victor and Rolf. In 2004, they got major stakes in Shu... Uemura. In 2006, they bought The Body Shop, which has actually been bought out by Natura, I believe it is. In 2006, they got the license agreement for Diesel. 2007, Purology Research, they bought them. 2008, bought Three Suisse. 2010, bought Essie. 2011, bought Pacific Bioscience, aka Claire Sonic. 2012, bought Urban Decay. 2014, Magic Holdings. Now, hold up. So this might not be something that people in the Western world know about, but Magic Holdings is basically the biggest makeup company you can get in China. And here's a fun little tidbit that was said by the CEO of L'Oreal when they bought them. This acquisition marks the acceleration of our conquest of new consumers in China. Doesn't that sound wholesome? Labeling something <laughs> as a conquest, it just kind of really hits home. It, the capitalism here. 2014, they bought Carita and Declior. In 2014, L'Oreal had a sealed deal worth 4.18 billion to buy back 8% of its shares from Nestle. Nestle's shares in L'Oreal reduced from 29.4% to 23.29%, whilst the Betancourt Myers family shares increased from 30.6% to 33.2%. So obviously there is this big tie that is going on between Nestle and L'Oreal, which is something I can do a separate video about if you want. Please do let me know down below because I'm always interested in these sorts of things. 2014, they bought NYX. 2014, they bought Nile Cosmeticos Group, which is a Brazilian hair care company. 2014, they bought Carol's Daughter. 2016, they bought It Cosmetics. 2016, they bought Atelier Cologne, which includes Cacharel, Armani, Yves Saint Laurent, to name a few. 2016, they bought Saint Gervais Mont Blanc. 2017, they bought the skincare brands CeraVe, Acne Free, and Ambi. The brands were purchased for 1.3 billion in cash. In 2018, they started the business of House 99 with David Beckham. 2018, they had a partnership for Valentino for fragrances and beauty. 2018, Modi Face and all of La Roche Posay parent company, Society de Thames de la Roche Posay. They bought them. In 2019, they got a license agreement with Prada. 2019 slash first quarter of 2020. They bought the fragrance division of Clarins. This division includes the following companies. Mugler, Thierry Mugler for fashion. Clarins Fragrance Group, CFG. CFG France, Cosme Europe, and CFG UK. So, has anyone been keeping count? Because uh, ever since they started, they 
actually own 46 companies. And that's not including licensing agreements or companies they've bought major stakes in. That's pretty mammoth. And when you actually look back at that timeline, it really does kick off basically like the 60s started it and then you kind of get through to the 90s and it gets very aggressive all the way through to now. It just gets more and more aggressive and that's, that's pretty big. So I want to get into about animal testing from L'Oreal as well because they have cloudy wording on their website and they do still allow testing on animals. Some of their brands are actually cruelty free and listed on the Logical Harmony website which is great. Um, with the obvious disclaimer that they're owned by L'Oreal for the people like me who care about that sort of parent company relationship. These are companies like Urban Decay, NYX, Purology. As L'Oreal sells in mainland China, there can be no guarantees made that their products won't be tested on animals as there are still laws in place for formulas that must be tested on animals. Now, I do actually want to commend the work that L'Oreal has done to work against animal testing as they've funded so many different things to alternatives to it, which is awesome. And they say that they've been working with the Chinese government for 10 years on their website um, to eliminate all animal testing and the thing is part of me is a bit suspicious about this right because it's been over 10 years and it's only now that they've actually kind of relaxed a little bit in terms of the animal testing that they will do because they used to test everything so now as in the past year they've actually gotten a little bit more relaxed about what they will test and what they won't test but anything if there is a concern by a consumer, by anyone, they can just pull that from the shelves and test it on animals. So that's why you can't really trust stuff that's being sold in China. It's just not clear. And of course I'll have the L'Oreal FAQ link down below. And there is one more thing, because this is something that affects every single one of these parent companies, every single one of them, and that's mica. So it's a hot topic that people have actually finally kind of realized is a big problem, which is one of the reasons I love Lush, because Lush only use synthetic mica. So basically anything that has some shine, some sheen, you see how this is shiny? See how my highlight in here is shiny? Lip glosses, basically anything that kind of has a glitter, that's probably made using mica, and mica is mined obviously by children for the most part, and this happens a lot in India in particular, and there, there is just a whole range of things. I want to make an individual video just focusing on mica, because I feel like now that people have started to take an interest in it, I think that we can really capitalize on pushing back on companies that are still using these mines. L'Oreal are one of the companies that actually do address their use of mica, which is really, really good to see, so I think that's very important. So in the past five years, they've actually been a bit more focused on sourcing it ethically. They seek to favor businesses that comply with uh, business standards. What does that mean? There is no clarity here that it's like, see, with our business standards. So that can be any business standards. That can be like, a child must be no younger than the age of three. That could be anything, like there is just, it's just so opaque and ugh. So they say roughly 60% of the mic they use is from the USA and the rest is from India. And they say they've been actively working to ensure that mica mines comply with humane working standards and are audited. They say that 98% of the mica they use is sourced from secure places today. So that means closed gate places. Yeah, I want to make a separate video on this. I just, it feels too shady to me, honestly. So, so yeah, again, I'll link that down below and I'll also link to another website I found really interesting on the whole mica thing, which I think that you'll enjoy if you are interested in ethics in any way. I did actually mention that I want to do a deep dive into each individual company because I found out some very interesting lawsuits that have happened for some of these parent companies, which I would like to go into. Things like what happened with Olaplex and Drunk Elephant and why Drunk Elephant weren't bought out by L'Oreal in the end, and now, now owned by Sashado. Um, there's a whole bunch of tea. So again, let me know if you want me to do individual ones on that, because I find that super interesting. Back baby, and uh, we've upgraded to uh, some vegan wine. Another beauty giant is of course Estee Lauder. So everyone knows about Estee Lauder anyway. Um, they own 28 companies, of which only Smashbox, 
Too Faced, Becca and Evita are cruelty free. Bumble and Bumble and Le Labo haven't actually confirmed with Logical Harmony if they're cruelty free so I'm not including them on this list because uh, my standard is Logical Harmony's standard and if Tashina doesn't think that they're cruelty free because they haven't made the effort to actually confirm with her despite reaching out multiple times, um, I ain't got time for you, <laughs> sorry. The rest of them test on animals, that's what that means, uh, so yay. It's just one of the things you have to do in order to sell in mainland China. It's just, it sucks and this is why I want to talk about this as well. Financials. Estee Lauder, they made 14.86 billion US dollars in sales in 2019 and a 2.31 billion in operating income. They have shares which honestly have just been growing it year on year for the past 10 years business wise is very impressive like when you actually look at these charts like just honestly business wise it's just really impressive what you can do when you're a behemoth and you just keep on gobbling up other people's work it's actually kind of amazing so let's go on to their history shall we because these are all of the Estee Lauder brands that currently exist in their little wonderful realm but sometimes I just really like to see how a company has acquired these, what their timeline's like, and if you've got any questions about like how something came to be, comment down below because I'm all here for digging up dirt. <laughs> so they began in 1946. In 1964, they launched Aramis. In 1968, Clinique became part of their clique. In 1990, they bought Origins, which was actually founded by Estee Lauder's son, Leonard Lauder. Lauder? And then in 1993, they got licensing for Tommy Hilfiger. In 1994, they um, did an investment in MAC Cosmetics, and then they fully acquired them in 1998. 1995, they bought Le Maire. In 1995, they got licensing for Kilton. And also, in 1995, they went live on the Stock Exchange. In 1997, they got licensing for Donna Karen. In 1997, they also bought Evita. In 1999, they bought Jo Malone London. 2006, they bought Bumble and Bumble. 2005, they had an agreement with Tom Ford in 2005 to develop and distribute fragrances and cosmetics under the Tom Ford Beauty brand. In 2010, they bought Smashbox Cosmetics. In 2012, they bought Aaron Beauty. In 2014, they decided to buy Rodin and Le Labo. In 2016, they bought Becca Cosmetics. Also in 2016, they bought Too Faced. Over the past 30 years, they've bought 13 companies, down to the cruelty-free animal testing thing. So Estee Lauder do still test on animals. They are actually pretty inspiring with the work that they have been doing though, so I want to highlight this when a company is actually trying to make a difference, trying to sway away from that. Still, you could just opt not to sell in China, but then money talks, right? They're actually part of Cruelty Free International and the Humane Society International and Humane Society USA, which is so great to see, honestly. The website states that they've also been striving to be cruelty free over the last 30 years, which is the exact same as what L'Oreal said. So I'm like, hmm. There's a full breakdown on their website, which I'll link down below. Um, they do, however, still test on animals, as they say, as required by law. We all know what that means. Um, just means that they can sell in mainland China. Also, Estee Lauder have been in a few hot water situations with legal battles. Um, you guys probably know about Decium CEO and also the EEOC situation that they had with parenting stuff. I'm happy to go into that with you at another time if you want me to. Now I want to start on a new brand so we're gonna go into Unilever. Now you might not think that they will actually have beauty products because you're like, don't they do shower things and soaps? You're right, they do. So Unilever actually officially founded in 1930 when two companies, so there was Margarine Uni and Lever Brothers, they joined forces as they, as they both produced products made of oil and fats for primarily soap and margarine. So in that time, they actually nearly outstripped the supply of raw materials in the early 20th century. It's funny because you can kind of see history repeating itself right now. I shouldn't say it's funny because it's actually really scary. They specialize a bit more in hair care, skin care, soap and personal care. And you'll have definitely used their products or heard from them. So I'll just have on the screen now all of the brands that they own. Now, this is actually only limited to the beauty personal care products because they have things like Dove, Vaseline, Rexona, Lynx, Sunsilk, Ponds, Tresemme, Tony & Guy, Simple, St. Ives, VO5, Impulse, Radox, Fair & Lovely, which is a um, skin lightener used in India, which is absolutely horrifying, and there's actually a lot of really bad stuff in those skin lighteners, and I'm sure that you can find videos on YouTube about it, but again, I'd love to dive into that because 
that is a horrifying world I don't really know much about and um, I'm always keen to learn new things which will um, haunt me as I try to go to sleep. They actually have over 400 brands which is um, giant. <laughs> there have been numerous issues with Unilever and a brand that big is honestly bound to have them. Um, in particular there's a focus on palm oil as it's commonly used in food and personal care items. And again, I'll happily make a video on this later on. We know that palm oil literally destroys habitats. And there have been a whole bunch of other things that Unilever have done. And I'll actually link down below Kristen Leo's um, video because she's done a really, really good deep dive into them. And I'll be keen to actually do that yet again. Just, just diving into it from a different perspective. So I'm actually going to just focus on the acquisitions that they've made on beauty and personal care. Now, this was actually rather challenging to find because they have 400 brands and they don't have a timeline. They don't have anything about when they did all of this stuff, when they've purchased all of these companies with all of the different acquisitions. I can understand why there's not really a central database that a regular person can access, but it kind of feels like there really should be for the fact it's such a household name um, without people realizing it. But anytime you see that little you, that's them. <laughs> Now again, when it comes to the whole animal testing thing, yeah, they'll do it. It's a little bit sad, really, with Unilever. So Unilever, they do test on animals still. Now I do want to point out that the CEO, I've forgotten his name, but it was oh, something like Luke, something rather. I'll put it on the screen. Um, he actually stated, this was a few years back, I think it was around about 2015 or something. He said that he really wanted to have a big focus on sustainability and making sure that packaging was reduced, that people were getting adequate working conditions and the lives of people, like especially women, would be a lot more empowered because they, they source a lot of raw materials from third world countries. And so a lot of it comes from India. So basically they, they target Southeast Asia in terms of places where they can source things from. And so it's easy for them to take advantage of people. And if this is all true, if they have managed to make the difference that they state that they've made, then I'm all for it. I think that that's fantastic. I was having a look through their, you know how you have those end of year financial reports and their goals are pretty impressive because I know that a lot of companies, they just have wishy-washy things. It's like <sighs> reduce emissions for the year. And it's like, you don't have any solid ground on what some of that is. But at the same time, they say that they source things sustainably and there is no legal definition of what sustainably has to mean. There is, it's the same way that cruelty free, you can say that anything is cruelty free and it doesn't actually have to meet any particular standard. So that's why I'm a little bit skeptical when it comes to things like saying it's sustainably sourced because there is no actual way to say whether something is sustainable or ethical. What might be sustainable to me might be very unsustainable to someone else. You know what I mean? Like everyone has like this big sliding scale and there's no quantifiable measurement for that. So that's why I really do have a problem with that. And that's something I would happily dive into just on Unilever and that their sustainability promises. This reporter that was trying to actually find where their farms were based is so hard because they're not listed anywhere. So how are you meant to verify through audits, through third parties, through someone that isn't actually part of the company who can just say, oh yeah, that's great. I mean, it's like, that kid's five, it's fine. They can definitely go picking those leaves. They can definitely go into that mic of mine. Without having that third party going in and doing that, how are we meant to believe this? You know, I, we need to see the actual results. We need the transparency. So I would be very keen to do that. 1900 Lux was created. It now has subsidiaries like Caress and there are a whole bunch of different subsidiaries of just the Lux brand alone. 1989, um, they bought Created Magnet. In 2003, they bought Close Up, which is a toothpaste. In 2009, they bought TIGI. In 2010, they bought Ampere Life Sciences, which is a digital bi biology technology platform. 2010, they also bought Sara Lee Personal Care, I didn't know that Sara Lee did anything other than frozen desserts, but sure. In 2011, they bought Alberto Calvo Company, which includes VR5, St. Ives, Tresemme, Nexus, White Rain, Consort, FDS, and Clear. In 2015, they bought Ren, which is skincare. They also bought Dermalogica and Murad and Kate Somerville. In 2016, they bought the Dollar Shave Club. Now, how many people are sponsored on YouTube by the Dollar Shave Club? 
It's interesting that they were bought in 2016 and it was basically since then that we got all of these adverts, isn't it? I'm just saying. 2016 that they got 7th Generation Incorporated. In 2017 they bought Living Proof. 2017 they also bought Hourglass. In 2017 they launched Apothecare, which is a private label of theirs. In 2018 they bought Schmidt's Naturals, so that's deodorants and things like that. If you're in the cruelty-free space you'll know that brand. In 2018 they bought Koala. 2018 they also bought Equilibria, which is an Italian personal care brand. 2019 they bought Garantia, and also in 2019 they bought Tatcha. I've linked down below to an article that shows more of the brands which are lesser known in the beauty world because honestly there is just a limit to how much I can talk about this in this sort of overview video that we're doing right now. From 2015 like brands like Dermalogica, 7th Generation, Living Proof and Apothecare and Smith Schmidt's Naturals, they're all fairly green approaching brands so it's you can see the influence of the CEOs, they've tried to acquire these definite more green labels. I want to get started on Shish Shiseido. This is a brand that we all know quite well, amazing Japanese company and they're very very passionate, they're known for being incredibly passionate about all of their skincare and makeup. They're, they're like, it's, it's amazing the passion that began the company. And they made 61.4 billion yen in 2018, which is, that's how much they made in US dollars, just for 2018. Shiseido was founded in 1927, and this is after Aronobu Fukuhara uh, began the entire endeavor in 1872. Do still test on animals in order to sail in mainland China also. And they, and on their website, they've, <laughs> established a safety assurance system based on alternative methods and have discontinued animal testing in cosmetics and quasi-drugs that are developed in April 2018 or later. Here's the important part ladies and gentlemen and everything in between. This excludes cases in which we must explain the safety to society. When do you have to explain the, the safety to society on cosmetics? What are you putting in there? Arsenic? <laughs> this just means uh, if law requires it in a country, instead of not selling to that country, uh, they'll just allow testing for safety reasons. Sounds legit. So they do have a number of companies that they own, some of which you may know, some of which you may not, as many are based out east, obviously, because it's a Japanese company, it just makes sense that they would have expanded from there, but they have honestly cracked the western market so well, it's very impressive from a business standpoint. So they own 16 makeup brands, 6 perfume brands, 7 personal care brands, and 8 prestige brands. Uh, which fall into the category of cosmetics and skincare. So that's 16 plus 8, 24 brands that deal in makeup. You'll we'll definitely know of their prestige brands Bare Minerals, Benefique, NARS, Laura Mercier, Claire de Peau, I'm, I'm butchering all of these, Tessila, Ipsa, and we all know now that they've signed that big agreement with Drunk Elephant after L'Oreal missed out after that lawsuit. Shiseido actually do have some of their acquisitions listed on the website for each brand which is really good but in some cases they don't um, but also the way that, that um, Shiseido have actually split up their company is they kind of had different different areas of sh Shiseido set up say for example they've got USA Shiseido, Europe Shiseido they, they've set it up kind of in this sort of manner so they've got separate companies all kind of falling under the main Shiseido umbrella, but then it's all of these ones underneath who then have done their own work, but then Shiseido's also got brands underneath them that distribute to all of them. Um, yeah, it's a different business model. <laughs> In terms of what I'm gonna be able to share with you, because I didn't dig down into each individual one of those separate companies, kind of like an overall look at what Shiseido have actually done since they opened and when they started to make big splashes, which is basically in 1949. They were listed on the, the Tokyo Stock Exchange. In 1982, they established Claire de Peau Beauty. In 1986, they bought Carita. 1987, they bought Ipsa. 1988, they bought Zotos. 1989, they bought Devlin Industries Incorporated. In 1991, they established Distiller, which is apparently a very fancy skincare regime. In 1981, they established Etuse Co Limited. In 1991, they also established Shiseido Luan Cosmetics Co. So in 1994, they established Ayura Lab Laboratories, um, which was actually sold in August of 2015. In 1996, they bought Helen Curtis North America Professional Division. Happened in 1997. 
1998, they bought Lemoore's salon business. In 1999, they bought Bristol Myers Squibbs salon brands in Japan. In 2000, they bought Seabreeze from Bristol Myers Squibbs. In 2000, they bought Nars. In 2001, they established Canary Incorporated and then sold that in 2017. In 2010, they bought Bear Essentials, which you'll also know as Bear Minerals. In 2016, they bought Laura Mercier and Revive through purchasing Gerwich Products LLC. 2016, they also bought the license agreement for Dolce & Gabbana perfume. And in 2019, as we now know, they purchased Drunk Elephant. A lot of these brands I've actually never heard of and it's something that is actually kind of good to know about because I know um, from other research that I've done is they actually have just done a restructure to bring Elixir and Anessa brands to Asian, European and North American markets and the Ginza brand they want to expand across Europe. So depending on where you are in the world you'll start to see these products actually cropping up as well and those are owned by Shiseido. Let's get started on Coty. So you'll definitely know Coty brands as well. I'm actually just going to put my feet up. Look at that, that's better. For example, Coty actually owns Kylie Cosmetics and Kylie Skin. Along with other brands, which I know I've used in the past, including Rimmel, OPI, Clairol, Max Factor, Guess, Weller, Sally Hansen, GHD, CoverGirl. The list literally goes on forever. Coty is massive and they have so many huge brands. It's wild how much they own and how successful they are. So in 2019, because their fiscal year is from June to June, they had net revenues of 9 billion. And I'll list down below their investors report for you too, because that was a lot. Just a lot. <laughs> so let's have a look about their own cruelty-free brands. They have one. One out of all of their brands is cruelty free and that's CoverGirl. So, and also one funny thing I found out whilst I was researching is, did you know that Coty used to be owned by Pfizer? Like literally the blue pill for the, they used to own it, legit. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. Um, so they owned them from 1964 and then back in the 90s, um, Coty was actually sold to Jab Holding Company. It went under another name back in the 90s. But Jab Holding Company, now if we're talking about behemoths, oh my word, that, I think, that's got to be one of the top 100 companies in the world. It just has to be, it's too big to not be. Let's just delve into what Coty has done in the past. So, this is their timeline. Again, I'm going to try and talk as fast as possible. 1904, they were founded and specialised in perfumes until the 30s. And Pfizer acquired Coty in 1964 and sold to JAB Holding Company in 1992. In 2003, they got the licensed format Jacobs Perfume. In 2005, they got Calvin Klein, Ceruti, Chloe, Lagerfeld, and Vera Wang licences that they actually bought off Unilever. In 2005, they got licences for Adidas, Davidoff, and Jupe. In 2007, they bought the DLI Holding Group, bringing along Sally Hansen and NYC New York Color Brand. In 2008, they got the license for Balenciaga. In 2009, they got the license for Bottega Veneta. Here's where we kind of begin with the acquisitions. 2010, they bought OPI. In 2010, they also bought Philosophy from the Carlisle Group. In 2010, they also got the license for Wimwe? which is Pada Prada. In 2012, their IPO filing began, which actually launched in 2013. If you don't know anything about IPOs, basically it means that they listed for people to invest in, so like the general public. And in 2014, they bought Bourjois. In 2015 to 2016, Coty acquired 41 brands from Procter & Gamble, collectively known as Gal Galleria. This includes Clairol, Covergirl, Olay, Gillette, Oral-B, Gucci, Hugo Boss, Max Factor, and Weller. The agreement uh, was completed as a reverse Morris Trust, made Coty the third largest global seller of cosmetics. 2016, they got a license for Tiffany & Co. 2016 to 17, they bought Hi Hyopermarkers, now Hyperafana, whatever that is. And 2016 to 17, they also got GHD. And in 2016 to 17, they became a unique majority stakeholder. Unique is an MLM company. 2017, they got the Burberry license. And in 2019, which is still obviously being solidified now because it was done later on in the year, they bought Kylie Cosmetics and Kylie Skin. So they, yeah, they've been busy at Coty. So obviously, as we can see from like Coty's past, they really did focus on getting perfumes because they were well known for perfumes. So that stuck with their brand, which is why they own so many perfumes today. It's just interesting seeing <laughs> all of that, honestly, like when you list it out because... That was only since 
2000 that I've covered from. There's a very interesting Reuters article on the Galleria contract thing that happened. It was just really interesting to actually see how that deal went down. Um, yeah, it's, it's just kind of crazy to me how these companies have done, honestly. In terms of ones I haven't actually delved into for this video, because they're a lot more body care focused, so there is Procter & Gamble. I've got their brands on the screen now. Honestly, like, Procter & Gamble, they, they aren't really very much in this space anymore. Um, but Johnson & Johnson, they do have stuff. So you've probably used Johnson & Johnson for your personal care. Everyone knows about No More Tears. Everyone knows that pretty much everyone will have used it at some point. Same as their baby powder. Baby powder has got quite a controversy around it as well. Um, but they have brands like Neutrogena, Clean & Clear, Rock, or ROC, however you want to call it, Rogaine, um, Aveeno, a few other ones. I'll, I'll obviously have it listed up on here. If you want me to do a deep dive into those ones, I am quite happy to. I just feel like because my brand is a lot more around the beauty space, I really want to try and focus on those more beauty focused ones. How many things are owned by companies and how aggressive they've been in their buying because it's, it's honestly a lot and I really do want to dig into this a bit more. I find it kind of dodgy that there's not singular places that you can go to see, even on their company's websites. Like, you can see the brands that they own, but you can't see when they're acquired, how much they're acquired for. I know some people can be touchy, oh, but it's about money. It's billions of dollars. It's literally billions of dollars to buy out all of these companies. So this is kind of two-pronged for me, because part of me wonders what got those companies into such a position that they needed to be bailed out and bought out by a bigger company or was it just their greed needing or wanting to have that security because it must be really scary having your own company so there's like no shade at them for wanting to join it with a brand that they felt was aligned with them but out of all of them I feel like Coty is probably is a lot less concerned with ethics I feel like Unilever like the facade that Unilever put up is good. I'll just put it that way. Same as with L'Oreal and same as with Estee Lauder. Um, I feel like the stuff that they're doing, or appearing to be doing, like with the way that they're on different palm oil um, round tables and all this other stuff, I kind of feel like they're showing that they're doing the right thing, but there was nothing really about what Coty's doing. So it just makes me a little bit like... <sighs> I don't have anything wrong with people wanting to get rich. I've got nothing wrong with that. I just also feel like you shouldn't have to trample on others in order to build yourself up. Because that's kind of bullying behavior and I don't really like that sort of uh, mentality. It's like that hustle culture, I can understand. It just kind of feels like empty capitalism when it comes to these companies that are just swooping in and buying that could just be my own view on life because i value what people bring to the world a lot more than just hey you're good at that thing i'm gonna buy you out take a whole chunk of your profits and also i've got the ability to restructure whatever you do and i get to tell you whichever direction i want you to put your efforts into and it's just part of me struggles with that on a moral and ethical level <laughs> it's just it's funny to me how cloudy all of this is and that's why i wanted to bring it up that's why i wanted to show you all of the brands that are actually being used this is why i want to make this into a series and go further it will mean that i'll only be able to put up videos every two weeks because the amount of research that this requires is massive and i work full time and i'm also planning a wedding so <laughs> it's it's kind of a lot, but I just wanted to actually come here and talk to you guys about it and shed a bit of light. Because I feel like it's very important that people know where they're buying from, know the way that companies are functioning, where you get your household products that you've been raised with. Like, literally, I've seen all of the products, every single one of them, when I went to go get groceries yesterday. All of them. It's funny how they make their way into our lives. Once that acquisition has happened, um, I'm interested to see what you guys think of this as well because I'm a bit more left in terms of my beliefs and I'm just interested to hear about what you think about this stuff. I know that our dollars are the best way that we can hit companies and the best way that we can support companies and the way that we can make a massive difference because you vote with your dollar for what you want to see more of in the world. And so again, that's why I'm very stringent with, with the way that I actually spend money. I'm 
I do a lot of research into a brand before I buy from them and yeah if I don't believe in your story if I don't believe in what you're trying to do then I'm not gonna buy from you. <laughs> I hope that this was interesting for you as it was for me. I'm sorry for how long this video was because I know it will have been very long and I really appreciate you for actually sticking around and watching as much of it as you did. It's crazy how dark things can actually be when you find out more and more about the world and then you realize how much you don't know. <laughs> so yeah, thank you lovers so much for watching. I'll be, of course, carrying on with my beauty reviews and tutorials and doing some wedding updates once we get married because we get married in March. So it's very exciting. And um, of course it's going to be a vegan wedding and I've tried to get as much as I can second hand so it's all very exciting, very cool. And um, thank you once again so much for watching, I really do appreciate it. Hope you all have a wonderful week. God, I've talked for too long.